As the text described, there have been a couple of instances when individuals without any linguistic input, those who are born deaf to hearing parents, uh, have uh, created for us a unique situation to observe the invention or the generation of a new language. Now, on a limited level, as I mentioned in a previous recording, uh, we see home sign as sort of a primitive communication system uh, that is more advanced than any ape has shown uh, a, a propensity for, even in the most rich linguistic environments, but that they still are less advanced than a full-blown language has been observed to be. But back in the 1970s in Nicaragua, there was an incident where dozens and dozens of children who all had invented their own system of home sign were bussed into a deaf school, a central school that had been invented in order to teach these, uh, these kids how to communicate using uh, sort of lip reading and uh, oral training um, when deaf individuals uh, are asked to do this. It's a very excruciating and laborious process and usually has very little success. Uh, they go through a process of having you place your your hands over the lips of a, of a speaker and on the throat of a speaker and uh, learning what uh, what sounds are coming out, what are associated with those lip movements and trying to, over time, guess, make the best guess for what's, uh, what's being said when somebody is when somebody's moving their lips. And the problem with this system is uh, that lip movements are uh, so minuscule, so very tiny in their, uh, in their expression, that just looking at somebody's lip movements actually doesn't yield good results in trying to interpret what it is they're saying. In other words, uh, lip reading is virtually impossible. Since it's so difficult, even for people who can hear, much less for people who can't, the individuals who were bussed into this school ended up developing some universal system of sign, of communication with each other when they were on the bus or when they were at recess. And uh, even though they weren't allowed to use it at first, the teachers eventually took notice of this system and began to systematically study it and realized that the uh, that the method of communication was much more complicated than they had originally given it credit for. It, wa it, it showed traits of being linguistic in nature. And uh, as they began to study it with generations of students who joined the school later, they could see that uh, kids who joined in future generations, and, and I don't mean generations in the same sense as uh, you or the next generation from your parents, but I mean uh, slightly younger children, maybe while teenagers were the older children, uh, kids in, kids age 5 to 10 uh, were the younger generation. But younger children who come came to the school ended up using systems of communication that were more in more and more linguistic, more and more advanced. And this suggested that there was something going on in, in, this, uh, in, in these young children who were joining the school in that they, had, they must have had some kind of sensitive period. We call this, uh, basically this, this word is used to refer to a window of time where somebody is more inclined to acquire a new language or linguistic components uh, than they are at other times in their life. And because of these young children's sensitive period that they could acquire this new, the, the, the new aspects of this language, the children who came to the school later ended up incorporating more and more stringent requirements into the linguistic code, uh, into that the the system of rules that uh, governed their sign language, and by observing this phenomenon. Uh, of Nicarag Nicaraguan Sign Language, we can see uh, a principle that children are one mechanism by which new information is injected into a linguistic code. Given a situation where information is somewhat arbitrary and difficult to understand because of ambiguity, these young children would incorporate additional components into the sign that became required aspects of the language in order to clarify ambiguities and make them less confusing. I should note here that the fact that there is a sensitive period in children who are learning languages 
that children learn languages easier than adults do, and that they are able to acquire native-like fluency in second languages in a way that adults are never able to never able to do, is sometimes pointed at as evidence in favor of the nativist camp. You see, it doesn't make any sense if language is based in general cognitive components, the general structures that just allow us to think socially anyway, if language is based in those cognitive structures, it doesn't make any sense at all that we would lose the ability to acquire language masterfully as we grow. Rather, there must be something, the nativists say, built into the brain that allows us at these early stages to grow and to develop uh, uh, some kind of language in that sensitive period that we, w that we don't have later on, that it must be built somehow into our genes. Now, it's possible, this is, your, your text doesn't describe this, but my, uh, but my thinking on the matter is, it's possible that this sensitive window is closely related to the increased synaptic plasticity in young children that we don't see in older adults. For instance, if a young child were to experience severe brain damage, sometimes even a whole hemisphere uh, can be removed in what's called a hemispherectomy. If a whole hemisphere of the brain is removed from a young child, that child's brain, the, re the remaining hemisphere of the brain, can learn to adapt and allow the child to live an essentially normal life. If an adult were to lose an entire hemisphere of their brain, then the ramifications of that would be severe and long-lasting. The, the, an adult would not uh, be able to adapt uh, to such severe brain loss or brain damage, uh, suggesting that it could be because of just general neural plasticity that, uh, uh, that we have this sensitive period as children, and it could in fact be attributed to general cognitive mechanisms. In much the same way that we see uh, human language recreated, evolve again anew, in the case of these people who uh, in Nicaragua were placed in a school together, we've observed a similar phenomenon among, uh, among finches and other kinds of songbirds. We notice that uh, if we isolate them from their parents so that they cannot hear and acquire language, that they, um, that they won't be able to sing an ordinary song in their adulthood, but they will sing uh, some derivate, some, some song that's, uh, that's broken or odd. Um, when subsequent generations of finches are exposed to that broken song, they fill in missing parts of the song, and future generations continue to do that until the finch's song is basically reconstituted from, from nothing into something. But importantly, this song that now exists uh, is not like the original song that was lost. It's a new song, a new version of a song that was uh, recreated literally out of nothing. So there, you, you can see then that there is no genetic underpinning that caused the, the finches to sing a specific kind of song. 